Chapter Twelve: Danger Signals. Pearl was very silent and very pale during dinner. As for Amy, she simply waited, for she knew that in time her cousin must speak. She was nevertheless hardly prepared for the manner in which the conversation at length opened. The peaches were being handed round when Pearl, glancing suddenly at the girl opposite to her, asked abruptly, "Amy, how was it that you went with Lord with that man today so far from home?" "I was taking a walk with him," replied Amy quietly. It seems to me that you accompany him very frequently in his walks, Amy. Ralph said the other day that he saw much less of you nowadays than formerly, your time being so greatly engrossed by Lord Martinworth. This sounds very strange to me, considering the circumstances. And I think, dear, if you will forgive my saying so, we are playing a rather dangerous game. Amy Mendovi did not reply for a minute, while she made little heaps on the table with her bread crumbs. I think she said at length, and the colour rose in her cheeks. If another time Ralph finds that he has a grievance, it would be best if he complained to me instead of confiding in other people. He didn't complain. He is far too loyal to do that, whatever he may feel," retorted Pearl. But. I saw he was looking worried and out of sorts, so I asked him what was wrong. If anyone is to blame, it is I. For a time, Amy seemed preoccupied, and then she said in a low voice, "Pearl, surely Ralph, surely you do not think that I, I am amusing myself with Lord Martinworth, that I am flirting with him." Pearl put her hand on her young cousin's arm, for by this time they had risen from the dinner table. "I don't know what to think, Amy," she replied, with her grave, sweet smile. "This friendship is seems so unusual, so strange." "Nevertheless, it is easily explained," retorted Amy quickly. "I rather like Lord Martinworth, but only rather, for he is often very peculiar, very odd." I frequently find it difficult to make him out, but one thing I'm sure, I never felt quite so sorry for anyone in my life as I feel for him. Pearl, that poor man is so desperately unhappy. He worships you. Of course, it is all very wrong. At least I suppose it is, but I'm sure it is natural enough. What is more, I believe, poor fellow, the worry is actually turning his brain. He does and says such strange things, Pearl, and is so morose. He has taken a fancy to me simply and purely because I'm one of your belongings, and I, out of sheer sympathy, sheer pity, go for walks with him, and have tried as much as I can to cheer him up with my chatter and my nonsense. So now you understand. As for flirting, this idea is absurd. Why, I never knew such a silent, abstracted man. But he seems grateful to me when I rattle along, and he brightens up a little at times. I thought he was doing some good for once, in a way," she added plaintively, but seemed merely to have succeeded in placing myself in a false position. Pearl merely sighed. Impatiently in reply, she wandered aimlessly about the room, then fidgeted with a piece of work, then opened a book, but almost as quickly closed it. At last, she took a lily from a flower vase and began abstractedly pulling it to pieces. Finally, she went towards her cousin and, placing her hand upon Amy's arm, glanced up into her face. Amy, she said almost. Inaudibly, did you, did you see that awful, that terrible look that he, that Lord Martinworth gave me today when he came upon Stanislas and myself in the hut? Yes, replied Amy without hesitation. I saw it, dear. Amy, I must tell you what I think. 
there was murder in that look. Pearl's eyes grew round with fear. She hurt Amy's arm as she whispered these words. I felt it. I knew it, she added, and it was the suddenness, Amy, of this overwhelming positive knowledge that made me faint away. Hush, dear, hush, replied Amy, putting both arms round her. You are excited and nervous. Your nerves are unstrung. You know they never have been quite normal since your illness. You are apt, darling, to fancy and exaggerate things. You are thoroughly upset, Pearl. He simply looked angry and surprised, dear, as well he might, for, of course, he is ignorant of your engagement to Stanislas. Seeing you together in the hut, and, and so affectionate, must have been his first inkling of anything out of the common. Amy, exclaimed Pearl, unlocking the girl's arms from about her waist. You are not speaking the truth, and you know it. Don't you understand that I, who have known Lord Martin Worth for so many years, have learned by heart every look of his eyes, every expression of his features? And do you for a moment suppose that I have ever seen that look, or anything like it, on his face before? Never! And I pray God I may never see it again. If I do, I know there can be no possible escape for me. For as surely as I am standing in this room, Dick Martinworth will kill me. At these tragic words, Amy gave a little cry and her lips grew pale. Both women lapsed into gloomy silence while Amy, once more placing her arms tenderly around her cousin, drew her out onto the veranda. They watched the moon in all her glory, lighting up with mystic glow mountains and woods and silent lake. The soft, mild light seemed to have a soothing effect upon Pearl's storm-tossed mind, for after a time she spoke more calmly. Of course, she said with a long-drawn sigh, it was very, very wrong of me just because I was upset half mad with fear to behave as I did to poor innocent Stanislas. I cannot now understand how I could have called him, Stanislas, of all men, a coward. How I could have said those wicked things about his killing, killing the other one. I did not know, Amy, I had it in me to be so hard, so unjust, so, so cruel. But lately, I have discovered more than one detestable trait in my character unguessed before. Oh dear, if you only know how I hate and scorn myself, how cordially sometimes I wish I were dead. If, replied Amy, alarmed at this fresh outburst, and speaking in her most calm and composed manner, if you do not intend that Monsieur de Gordonfeld should carry out your wish of killing Lord Martinworth, you had better, perhaps, let him know without further delay that you have changed your mind. I believe people even in these enlightened days still sometimes fight duels. Pearl looked startled and then she sighed wearily but made no reply. As the evening wore on, she grew calmer and more collected, but she did not again refer to the subject. And by the time Amy left her, all traces of excitement and tears had vanished. Stanislas de Gudenfeld had returned home, feeling thoroughly upset and distressed, making every allowance that he reasonably could for the temporary excitement of an hysterical woman, he still found it difficult not to feel wounded at Pearl's behavior, so uncalled for and inconsiderate. Of late, he had more than once noticed an irritability and fractiousness of disposition, which before her illness had certainly been unknown to him. But this was the first time he had been treated to such an outburst as that which followed the unfortunate meeting with Lord Martinworth. Even that, considering the circumstances, he would have freely forgiven, for he knew that women suffered from a malady called nerves and at such times they were apt to do and say strange things. 
what, however, he found it difficult to pardon and indeed to comprehend, was not only her air of chilly reserve, but the persistent ill-temper that Pearl had exhibited in the boat and even up to the actual moment of their parting on the shore. Stanislas de Guldenfeld had yet to learn that women's moods are incomprehensible in their uncertainty, inexplicable in their variety. From Pearl's misdemeanors, de Guldenfeld's thoughts flew to the ominous look witnessed on Lord Martinworth's face. In recalling it to mind, he was forced to acknowledge that the passion it expressed was simply diabolical. He remembered how this expression had staggered him as it crossed his vision, how his blood had boiled to think that such a glance should, even for one second, fall upon the woman whom he loved. In pondering over that look and the circumstance that gave rise to it, the Goldenfeld was seized with fury, and at that moment it was perhaps fortunate that Martinworth was considerably beyond the reach of the Swedish minister's muscular arm. And yet, as Stanislas grew calmer, he realized the difficulty of going to the extremity of killing a man in a duel, simply because the expression of his face had been of an unpleasant nature, and had consequently displaced him. He was still debating this question in his mind, wondering, as he puffed thoughtfully at his cigar, what steps could possibly be taken, and gazing in perplexity at the moon, which in its brilliancy seemed to mock at his lugubrious thoughts, when Sir Ralph Nicholson appeared on the veranda. There was a suppressed discomposure and hurry in the latter's manner, and he was paler than usual. I say, de Goldenfeld, he exclaimed, sinking into a cane chair, we've had a devilish unpleasant thing occur at the hotel. Martinworth has all but cut his throat with his own razor. Sapristi, exclaimed Stanislas under his breath, half rising from his chair. The fellow for the time being was evidently as mad as a hatter, continued Ralph. Fortunately for him, this charming little tragedy was enacted in his wife's presence. I have no notion what it called forth. There was a row between them, I suppose. But I have gathered from her that he suddenly rushed to the dressing table, and the next thing she saw was the gleam of the razor across his throat. She was up in a second, caught hold of the beastly thing as he was in the very act, had a tremendous struggle with him. She is a strong woman, you know, eventually secured it and probably pitched it out of the window. Good God, what a terrible business. Is the wound serious? He was bleeding horribly when I rushed in. The rooms are next to mine, you know, and through those thin partitions I heard the whole affair, the struggle, her screams, etc. I was just dressing for dinner. It appears, however, that the wound is not very deep. His plucky wife prevented that. Her hands are awfully cut about, too. But she's kept her wits and hasn't broken down for a single instant. But what have you done with Martinworth? Oh, he's calm enough now. And sane enough, too, for the matter of that. Fortunately, there is an army doctor on leave from Hong Kong staying at the hotel. He has bound up the wound and says that both Martin Worth and his wife will be all right in a few days. We've tried to hush the affair up as much as possible, but of course the story is bound to get about. The question is, de Goldenfeld, what on earth are we to do with Martin Worth? You think he ought to be put into confinement? inquired de Goldenfeld with a quick look. Well, you see, a man who attempts his own life is supposed, as a rule, to be hardly responsible for his actions. Besides, I personally look upon the fellow as a dangerous animal. Who knows but that the fancy may take him to attack someone else instead of himself? He has been awfully queer ever since he came up here, and I have not at all liked Amy being so much with him. 
She thought he seemed ill and unhappy, and kind-hearted little soul that she is, felt sorry for him. I blame myself now for not having sooner prevented this intimacy. But naturally, I felt a certain delicacy at interfering in her friendships. But that's neither here nor there. What on earth are we to do with the poor fellow? Dick Gordon felt. The two men discussed the question until far into the night. Eventually, what appeared like the right, indeed the only solution, was arrived at. They decided between themselves that as soon as the wound was sufficiently healed to allow of his removal, Lord Martinworth should be conveyed without delay to the general hospital in Yokohama, in which place he could be detained in the necessary confinement until it was found possible to transfer him to England. The plan was in every way a practical one, but in forming it, neither de Gurdenfeld nor Nicholson reckoned on the great opposition likely to be raised by one of the chief persons concerned, namely the wife of the injured man. The subject was approached by Ralph the next morning, who with that purpose in view, begged Lady Martinworth for a private interview. But after a short time, Looking pale and flustered, he rejoined de Guldenfeld, who was smoking his cigar while waiting for him outside the hotel. In emphatic terms, he announced that never again would he undertake such a mission, for he had passed through one of the most painful, the most unpleasant half-hours ever spent in his life. It appeared that after considerable hesitation and beating about the bush, Ralph came at length to the point. At first, he told de Gordonfeld, Lady Martinworth did not appear to understand, but that when she finally grasped his meaning, her anger was uncontrollable. She turned on Ralph and, positively white with rage, asked him how he dared to insult her and her husband, to say nothing of the family of Martinworth generally, with such an iniquitous proposition. She affirmed over and over again in the most angry and positive terms that Lord Martinworth was as sane as Ralph himself, that in fact the action of the night before had merely been the result of a temporary mental disturbance caused by an unexpected shock, followed by a great distress of mind. Of course, continued Ralph, I have no notion to what she referred, and my belief is she does not know herself what was the cause or the nature of this shock. I ventured mildly to insinuate that such an unfortunate state of affairs might recur, in which case the danger might not a second time be so easily averted. I was bound to point this out to her, but it was an unfortunate remark on my part, for on the strength of it, what the dickens do you think she did? Go on, replied his listener. What happened? She caught me by the hand, dragged me across the passage, and, would you believe it, before I caught on as to where she was going, ushered me straight into Martinworth's room. He, poor fellow, was lying on the sofa with his throat bound up, though he really did not look half as bad as one might have expected in the circumstances. I went up to him at once, but Lady Martinworth did not give me time to open my lips. Dick, she cried, I have brought Sir Ralph Nicholson into your room for the express purpose of proving to him what he declines to believe from my lips, the fact that you are a sane man. He affirms that you were mad last night when this unfortunate incident took place, that you are still mad and what's more, that you are likely to become worse as time goes on, and that consequently precautions must be taken. He comes here with a proposition which, if not so insulting, would really be downright absurd. I expect you will have something to say in reply to both the accusations and the remedy proposed. Of course, you must not talk, but write what you have to say on this. And pushing some notepaper towards him, she cast a last furious glance at me, and then and there left the room. Well, you can fancy, the Gordon felt, I felt a bit of a fool standing there. 
Certainly, my sentiments for Lady Martinworth for having deliberately forced me into such an unpleasant position were not of the most amiable description. My reasoning and accusations may have been perfectly correct. Still, naturally, no fellow likes being called a lunatic to his face, and I was quite prepared for any amount of anger or violence on Martinworth's part. However, to my astonishment, he did not seem at all put out. In fact, he looked quite agreeable, nodded and smiled, pointed to a chair and began writing at once. Here's his letter. I confess, it doesn't look much like the production of a madman. And Ralph extracted from his pocketbook a folded epistle, which he straightway handed to the good of them. You are both right and wrong, my dear Nicholson, it ran. Last night, I was as mad as people who are thoroughly sick of life and are determined to end it, generally are. The mood, the desire for self-extinction, has, however, passed. Today, I consider myself perfectly sane, as sane as you are yourself. Indeed, I now realize that I have a purpose before me. And until that purpose is accomplished, I can assure you I shall make no further attempt on my life. And even when my object is fulfilled, I really see no particular reason why I should wish to disappear. Shall I not then have reached the height of my desires? Therefore, why should I wish to die? But that is not the question now. What I wish to explain to you is that there is absolutely no reason whatsoever why I should be shut up. For I presume it was with that idea in your mind that you called on my wife this morning. I perfectly understand your view of the case. But I am not mad. So you can go away, my dear fellow, with the assurance that though doubtless your intentions are excellent, they are somewhat uncalled for and slightly premature. You're decidedly amused, Martinworth. Come and give me a look sometimes. I hope to be able to speak in a few days. It will enliven me much to see your cheery face. De Goldenfeld looked serious as he returned the letter. I cannot agree with you, Nicholson, he remarked after a minute or two, in considering this communication the letter of a sane man. Taking his previous acts into consideration, I judge by this letter that he is more dangerously cracked than I even at first imagined him. In what way? inquired Ralph. My dear fellow, we all know the deepness and cunning of a madman. And in my eyes, that letter is the acme of cunning. What I should like to know, does he mean by a purpose before him? What I ask you is that purpose. Mark my words, my dear Ralph, it means some fiendish design, which, if the poor fellow were sane, would probably be as far from his thoughts or his intentions as from yours or mine. Of course, nothing can be done without the sanction of his wife, but in my opinion, that man has no right to be at large. Let him work out his purpose in asylum if he likes not among the peaceful community of Chuzenji. Well, I don't see what is to be done, replied Ralph with a sigh. I only hope your suspicions are unfounded, and that there may be no further bother with him. At any rate, perhaps it will be just as well to keep Amy away from him for the present. Yes, and above all, Pearl, remarked de Goldenfeld darkly. Stanislas was particularly thoughtful as after this conversation he strolled towards Mrs. Nugent's house. He did not attempt to disguise from himself that he felt extremely anxious on her account. He could not get Martin Worth's murderous look out of his mind. It haunted him each time with greater vividness and meaning, and the more clearly it imprinted itself on his vision, the firmer was his impression that it was the wild vindictive, unreasoning look of a madman. He still seemed worried and preoccupied when he appeared on Mrs. Nugent's veranda. That lady, glancing quickly into his face as he went towards her, 
naturally misconstrued the cause. There were still moments when Pearl felt a certain shyness and dread of her future husband. The present was one of them. She was paler than usual as she gave her cheek to be kissed. Stanislas, she said, still holding his hand, I have been so ashamed, so unhappy at what occurred yesterday. I am consumed with remorse. Will you forgive me, dear? Recent events had obliterated Pearl's misconduct. Her words, however, recalled not only the annoyance, but the considerable distress of which she had been the cause. The Gudenfeld's glance, as it fell on her, was for once both cold and stern. If, Pearl, he said gravely, you hope in the future to feel well in your position as a diplomatist's wife, the first lesson you must learn is to control not only your speech, but your temper. But let us say no more about it, and his face softened as his eyes rested on her repentant face, and he took in all her dainty loveliness. The man frightened you. You are nervous and unstrung, dear. Perhaps I was wrong to attach so much importance to your irritability, or to be hurt at your treatment of me. Certainly, subsequent events have proved that you were to a certain extent justified in your alarm. What do you mean? asked Pearl quickly. Put on your hat and I will tell you in the boat. There is a delicious breeze for sailing. It will take us straight to Senji. It was only after much thought that the Guldenfeld decided to tell Pearl what had occurred at the hotel. He was anxious not to increase her fears. On the other hand, he knew that she must hear the story sooner or later, and he concluded that it were better she should get the true facts from him than to have imparted to her from some outsider a garbled and exaggerated version. Also, he was anxious, without frightening her too much, to impress upon her the great necessity for being on her guard, a task which he knew required both tact and delicacy. Altogether, Stanislas felt that he had a difficult business before him. He was very desirous that Mrs. Nugent should leave Chuzenji without delay. He intended to use all his powers of persuasion to convince her of the necessity for such a step. And although he was prepared for many objections, he little reckoned on the total failure of his mission. Pearl's steering was erratic and her startled eyes looked brighter and bigger than ever, while she listened in silence to all the Guldenfeld had to tell her. Hearing these distressing details was a truly dreadful ordeal to her. At each word, Stanislas let drop. Pearl felt as if a knife was being thrust into her breast. For if it were indeed true that Dick Martinworth were mad, Pearl instinctively knew that she alone was the cause of that madness. And as Stanislas's grave, calm words fell upon her ears, and the ghastly truth flashed upon her, that she, Pearl Nugent, had driven a man insane for love of her, she wept silently from very bitterness of soul. So this was the sole result of her strivings, her flight of three years ago, her struggle for respectability and for virtue. So this, the mental collapse of a man, once famous for his brilliant intellect, once noted for his calm impartial judgments, was the climax to what she, in her self-satisfied pride, had been wont to consider a fairly successful victory over manifold temptations, a triumph of entire self-control. It was but now, in obtaining cognizance of his supposed insanity, that Pearl fully appreciated the passionate yet self-sacrificing nature of Martinworth's devotion. She realized at that moment that it was this actual act of self-renunciation that had caused the present state of things, the unhinging of that once powerful mind. Her frame shook as this thought was brought home to her. That look of yesterday, everything, seemed to be explained 
in those three words. He is mad. He was mad, and she told herself that it was she, Pearl Nugent, by her self-righteous, cold, calm virtue and superiority, who had driven him insane. She looked out her eyes wide open with dumb misery at the blue expanse of water before her. Her hand was leaning on the tiller, but she did not move it. De Gunnenfeld, watching her tears, partly read and understood the remorse and agony of mind through which she was passing. He touched her with his hand. "Don't take it so hardly, dear," he said. "I dare say he will get all right again." Indeed, Nicholson thinks him so now, and you must remember he is the only one of us who has seen him since this awful thing happened. Don't you think you had better go away for a little, Pearl, until all this has blown over? You will get ill again if you worry so, if you take things so much to heart. Go away? What should I go away for? Where would you have me go? Oh. Up north, anyway. The Rawlinsons and I would, of course, accompany you. You must get out of this place. You will get ill again. You badly want a change, Pearl. I want a change, when I have not been here a month. No, I have no intention of moving for the present. I am not ill, Stanislas. I am quite well. All I implore is not to be bothered, to be left in peace. In spite of her petulance, De Gudenfeld persisted for some time in his entreaties, till finally Pearl, glancing up at him with an expression of bored surprise, informed him quietly but incisively that his arguments were a mere waste of breath, as she certainly had not the slightest intention of leaving Chuzenji, where she was so satisfactorily installed, until the hot season was over. Would you mind, she continued, once more giving me your reasons why you are so particularly anxious for me to exchange my pleasant little abode here, where I am cool and perfectly contented, for the discomforts of hot, stuffy tea houses? The reasons were not repeated. At that moment, the wind changed, and they had to put about. Later, when they were comfortably settled down again. Stanislas took a long look at Pearl's firm little chin. Not for the first time was it borne upon the Swedish minister's diplomatic mind the utter uselessness, the complete futility of trying to persuade Mrs. Nugent against her will.